Good morning, everyone. We are thrilled to be here today. Thanks for the intro. I'm Lara. I'm a product director at Empathy. And well, perhaps you have seen us uh, around in the event these days. But um, for those who, who don't, we are a software development, a product company focused on search and discovery uh, technology. So I'm here with my colleague Nina today and the topic that we wanted to bring to the table to share with you is something that is in our essence, is in our vision, in, in, in how we envision search. And um, the topic is privacy. So we truly believe that this is something that it's, uh, it should be in everyone's agenda working in digital nowadays. So we are going to uh, share with you something about this topic um, in, from two different standpoints. First, Nina is going to tell you about the negative impact of privacy violations and, and the key principles of online privacy. And later on, I'll be telling you how do we at Empathy act on privacy from a technology and, and product standpoint. So having said that, Nina, all yours. Thank you, Lara. Hello, everybody. So good to be back inside again and good to meet so many people in person again and meet new people too. So, like Lara said, I'm going to talk to you about the negative impact of privacy violations. And um, let's get started. Real-time bidding is the biggest data breach ever. In Germany, a person's online activity is tracked about 376 times per day without them knowing. In the US, that number is even higher, about 747 times per day. And uh, there are a lot more uh, countries listed in this. Uh, the survey was even bigger. We couldn't fit it all into one. But if you like to know more about this, I can point you where to find the survey by the uh, Irish Council for Civil Liberties later on. Find me uh, at our booth later. Um, so I'm not going to talk to you about real-time bidding. But what these figures clearly show is that our privacy is violated um, many times per day without us knowing and that GDPR, CCPA, and other data protection regulation do not offer sufficient protection anymore. So, who of you reads the privacy policies in cookie banners? Anyone? Raise your hands. Uwe, you do. Great. Do you understand it all? Do you know where your data ends up? No. Right. No, no one really does. And also, it doesn't really matter if you read it, because those texts are not made for humans. They're made for businesses to be able to comply with the current regulation. But where does it leave us as humans to make a sound decision whether we want to accept or reject cookies? And where does, how can we know where our data ends up? We don't. We somehow accept it, even though we're worried. But we shouldn't accept this, and we shouldn't take this as the normal. So. Technology evolves so fast, but we need a better enforcement and a faster enforcement to keep up with that. And um, policymakers and governments are not the only stakeholders in this. So today, I'm going to show you three key aspects in online privacy. First, uh, explain why protecting your own privacy is important for yourself, but also for society as a whole. Second, introduce you to five principles of data ethics. And thirdly, explain why those principles in practice and why the terms commerce and ethical are not as contradictory as you might think. Very often, I hear things like, I can accept all cookies, I've got nothing to hide. Well, that's good, but Secrecy is not quite the same as privacy, because privacy is not about hiding something. It's about protecting something, something quite important, your online identity, that is, your name, your address, your date of birth, your credit card details, your social security number, even your medical records, you name it. Because we don't want an algorithm to make a potentially false prediction and minimize our chances to get a job, an apartment, or a loan based on that data that we didn't even give voluntarily. 
The data is our own and is no one else's business. And it shouldn't affect our rights to be treated equally and fair. But this is what happens when data is treated as a commodity. Personal data, of course. The data is forced from us. We're nudged into consent. Sometimes it is built into an algorithm where we have no way of knowing it is even there in the first place. And informing a visitor of a website that cookie banners and trackers are in place is not enough. Um, so we need... Um, and, and making the acceptable button bright and shiny and the reject or more options rather small and more difficult to see is not how GDPR um, is, a, is a determined consent which should be freely given, specific, informed and unambiguous. So in summary, protecting your personal data helps up keeping equal opportunities regardless of race, gender or income. Um, and helping and rejecting cookies helps us make a change. Because the same rules that protect our fundamental rights offline need to be applied online as well. And now I'm going to show you five principles in data ethics as the moral ethical framework to support this. Oh, sorry, I slipped, skipped, skipped a slide or two. So, um, the first principle is accountability. It's the most important one. Assuming responsibility for your actions and how you handle personal data and taking active measures to demonstrate the that what you do with the data lies at the core of all the principles. Um, and without that, all the other principles are a lot less effective. The second one is ownership. You own the data, not the website that you're visiting. The third one, transparency, can be assessed by some simple questions. Why the data is needed. Context is key. Um, how, where, and how long it is stored, and who has access to this. Those questions are very helpful for businesses to limit the purpose of the data and also helps them to know which data they actually need and which data they collect and store, but they have no use for whatsoever. The fourth is consent. I've said it before, consent is not very active, but it should be an active authorization, giving permission of the use of your data. But for that, you need to know why the data is needed and where it is stored, referring back to transparency. And the fifth one is privacy. The most vulnerable data that we have is the personal data, and we need an extra layer of protection that is required to safeguard our online identities and to avoid mistrust and disloyalty. And now, moving to those principles in practice. Ethical and commerce. Isn't that a contradiction? What is ethical commerce? So, very often, this refers to uh, the products. Fair trade or organic products or uh, recycled items, you name it. But this refers to the end of the supply chain, to the products that we purchase. How can we, as developers of makers of beautiful search and discovery solutions, uh, take on, how can we take on responsibility for what we do and how we build um, the, the software? At Empathy, we pursue a privacy by design and ethical by design approach. Lara will explain to you in detail how we do it and what we do with that. But from an ethical perspective, we use our common sense. How would we want to be treated online? It's also uh, not, for us, not uh, data protection, something that our legal department is concerned with, but is ingrained into each and every one of us, into every apartment, uh, department and every person uh, that works at Empathy. Um, we don't collect any personal data, and we put the human at the center. This has lots of advantages. Data minimization is the first one, getting means... Minimizing the data that you need and that you use and collect means getting rid of a lot of liability because each personal data point is a liability 
for your company because um, when the data is leaked, it can result into terrible lawsuit um, and uh, does a lot of damage to your reputation. Second, invoking, establishing and retaining trust. Using less data means you can be a lot more transparent with how and why you use that data. This means giving trust to the customer. Giving trust means earning trust in return, trust and customer loyalty. And finally, those new privacy settings help raise the standards. They help educate the consumers, the individuals, the people that are visiting your website or purchasing from you, because uh, and help make them demand higher standards of protection for um, in our, on other websites as well. So, in conclusion, privacy violation today is common practice, but we as individuals can take certain steps to avoid, to, to protect our online identities better. But it takes a joint effort of government, policymakers, and the industry to make that change. Now remember, always to reject cookies, except of course for the edible kind. And now Lara, all yours. Thank you. Cool, so, well, how do we learn all this, everything that Nina has said in the design, uh, evolution, development of digital products? Shouldn't this be something of a strategic importance for everyone working in digital? Well, um, what I've brought here, it's a privacy timeline where you can see how legislation is becoming more and more strict on these topics. Lately, um, we all have heard many years ago about GDPR, CCPA, and lately all these scandals with analytics tools in, in several countries. So, legislation is becoming more strict, but how are brands positioning themselves towards this? The truth is that they are being a bit skeptical and they are waiting for legislation to impose things in order to take action. So it's like they are being reactive instead of being proactive with this topic. But for me and for us, the way we envision the product, digital products, it goes beyond that. Because if we think about what a digital product is, I, I always use a, a definition for someone uh, very knowledgeable on the product world, and um, he's Roman Pitzler, and he says that a digital product is something that is out there to create value for a group of people. So here's the first thing, that, the keywords in, in the sentence. A digital product creates value for a human. There is a human in front of the screen. It, it's solving a problem. Let's think all about all the digital products that we have surrounding us, like for listening to music, for watching series, for booking our holidays, we are all in contact with, with digital products. So we connect with them because they are creating us value. So how do we land this uh, on the search side of things. Of course, this was the example that I have in, my, so in mind, so I'm going to continue with this. What is the role of thinking about the search as, as a digital product? So, what is the role of search within an e-commerce? Let's think about ourselves. When we enter into e-commerce uh, and, and, and we go to the search, we have an intention. We want to find something. We, we want we want to connect with the brand, to ask, to get some information. So, in a way, the, the search within an e-commerce is a key touch point for the brand to connect with the consumer. And at the end of the day, brands want those consumers to be back. So, it's all about using the search to create a relationship. As, and, as every relationship 
It has to be based on trust. So, what's a better way to evoke this feeling of trust in our consumers than caring about their privacy? So, this is how we envision search at empathy. And this is why empathy is privacy, sorry, is at the core of what we do. When we think about new evolutions, when we develop new stuff, so this is the reasoning behind. And the important thing here is, well, you have been talking a lot about privacy, but how do you act on privacy? Well, I'm going to be focusing in the three main uh, components in the architecture, like affected, influenced by this privacy topic. And I'm going to tell you how do we, in, all, in each of those pieces, how do we act on these principles of privacy. So, I'm going to start with the experience, because at Empathy we always start with the experience, and then we figure it out from a technology standpoint. So, I've brought here two examples. This one is the, one of the latest components that we have added to our front-end component library. It's open source. We have the product owner of this bit in here, so you can ask later more <laughs> questions if you want. And this component is called My History. So what is this about? This is about showing the consumer the latest interactions they have had with the search. But it's not only that, because if you have a look, this component is being transparent with the consumer. It's telling them, OK, this information is only stored locally, and you are in control of it. You can enable, you can disable, you can delete this data. So the consumer, we are not only being transparent with the consumer, but we are giving them control. We are giving them this uh, capability for choosing. And this is what privacy is about, is giving the consumer the choice of what they want to do with their, their data. So, as I was saying, in, in this component, first we say, OK, this information is stored locally, it's here for you. If you want to enable, disable, you are in control. So, and then we have another example that is my preferences component. This is something that we are working on right now and goes a bit beyond that, because this component communicates with the, with the consumer. So if the consumer wants to share with us uh, preferences, their preferences, in order to get a, a more sophisticated uh, experience, okay, we again, we give them the option, the ability to choose, to make a choice. So in this uh, example that uh, we have here, it's um, from groceries. So the consumer can enable the preferences and add in their information about their habits, their, um, their diet, their uh, brands, and so. And again, this goes about being transparent and giving them control. Because as Nina was saying before, privacy uh, policies and, and cookie policies are not, it's not a way of being transparent. In here, you are telling everything to the, to the consumer. So, the next uh, pillar, the next component I wanted to focus is the data collection pipeline. So, well, this is uh, extended to many digital products. It's not only something about CERT, but in here, the first question that we ask ourselves at Empathy is, what is the data that we need? Because I think that we all have seen how many times a lot of data uh, is collected and then that data is not used. So that's the first question that we ask ourselves. And this is also a topic now with this sustainability theme that we are uh, hitting around. So that's the first question that, that we ask ourselves. And then how, how is this uh, done? Well, basically, um, the data pipeline is based on uh, data is collected based on three 
uh, isolated events, the query event to collect the search interaction, the click event, and add to cart event. Well, these simple events collecting very simple information about the search. But the important thing in here is that no PII or user ID is collected in those events. The only thing that is uh, collected in order to connect intera interactions is a session ID. That session ID is, a, is a stored locally. And once the session is finished, it expires and is not persistent, persistent in the system. So this is how the data pipeline uh, works. Three simple events, no PII, no user ID, only a session ID used for connecting uh, events that then expires. And this connects with what I was saying before. And what about if we want to give the consumer the option of sharing preferences, as we can have those preferences available locally in there for customizing, sophisticating the experience? Well, this goes to the component that I was uh, presenting before. It's another way of capturing data by caring about the consumer's privacy. And well, last but not least, relevancy, what a nice topic for a search product. So, how, well, after saying all this, like the, we only collect, the, only those three events are collected, you may be asking yourself, well, and can you provide a proper sophisticated relevancy with that little amount of data? Without, user, without identifying users, without having anything? Well, the answer is yes, well, what I'm going to say. But, um, and I'm going to tell you how. So first, we don't talk about personalization. We like to use the word contextualization. So the contextualize um, feature, it's, it's something that takes all the interactions from the wisdom of the crowd, all those clicks for those specific queries. And then that wisdom of the crowd is used for the relevancy of the upcoming queries. So in a way, this works very well with seasonal things, like uh, in summer, uh, if everyone is clicking uh, white t-shirts, well, for when you uh, look for t-shirt, the, the white one is going to be pushed a bit. So this is about using the wisdom of the crowd. Then, and this was a topic that was mentioned in here uh, yesterday with um, a, a whole session dedicated to that, offline evaluations. Again, that wisdom of the crowd, those uh, interactions for specific queries are used to anticipate how an algorithm is going to work. So if we, and, and well, the offline evaluations add some scoring to each of the products that will give us information in order to position better each of the products. This anticipates and this um, makes faster the, the innovation because with this, we, we don't need that uh, A-B testing or we can have an idea without spending like two or three weeks uh, doing a kind of A-B testing. So that's pretty useful for accelerating innovation. And last but not least, you perhaps may be asking yourself, well, and what about contextualizing a specific consumer, a specific individual, a specific session, search session? Well, on this topic, historically, we have been using historic data in order to predict what, is, what, the, what the individual is going to do next. So, putting an example, if uh, I have a coffee every day, so, well, tomorrow you are going to have a, a coffee as well. Well, but that's a very, that could be, could end up being a simplistic version of a human being. If we act li like that, if, if we personalize like that, shouldn't be like objectifying something as complex as a human being is. So 
Following this idea, what we are exploring right now in order to, as I was saying, contextualize that specific session is what is written in there, using the present to understand the intention. So going back to the example that I was uh, saying before with the, with the coffee, I feel that we know more that someone wants a coffee when they go straight to take the coffee machine, instead of when they wake up in the morning, just because the, day, the previous day they have a coffee. So this is the, the algorithms, everything that we are exploring right now, is just creating a sphere of knowledge around the, the specific intention in order to be more precise. And again, this goes on the fly without, a, without any uh, identification of the, of the individual, as I was saying before. So with this, I'm going to finish. Because in summary, at the end of the day, this is not something new. Like acting, uh, and acting on privacy in, in, the product in your product development is just as we always have been told, people working in product, we are, we are always told, like, put yourselves in the shoes of the customer. So this is the same. It's just treating them, as, as Nina was saying before, as we would like to be treated, being transparent, being clear, not hiding anything. Asking them, well, do you, do you want to have a more sophisticated experience? Do you want to share with us your preferences? This is how we're going to do it. Do you want to ask to do it or not? It's just a matter of positioning ourselves in this, in this way. So this is uh, what I wanted to tell you. As I said, we have a very nice team of engineers, people from product, from empathy. We are upstairs in the lunch. So, if you want uh, more information about something, I'm sure that someone that was involved in the coding of that is here today. So, this is what I wanted to share with you and in as well. So, now time for questions. For questions, if you have any. Oh. Thanks, uh, Nina and Lara. So now there is uh, some time for questions. So do we? Oh, we have one. I'll pass around the microphone. And by the way, I would like to remind everyone that this is a hybrid conference, and we also have um, so the ones that are watching us online, you can also ask questions, and I will read them out. So I'll come to you. So first of all, thank you for the talk. Uh, very commendable initiative. So I really liked everything so far. So I have a couple of questions. So the first one, what's the default in like the history sharing and tracking? Because we show us like the tool that gives the possibility to users to potentially hide and delete all the interactions. So what is the default, which sometimes is the most important? The default? Yes. It's on the um, it's on the client side of things. They decide the what they want to to do with the consumer. But uh, normally it's um, it's enabled by by default. But as the first time you enter the website, there is no uh, story. So you see that in there, and you decide if you want to use it or not before it starts uh, working. Because okay. when you see it in the experience, it's it's entity, so you decide before that's going to happen. OK. And the second question is, like, everything you show is really nice, but how can you build trust in your clients? Because anyway, uh, you know, a lot of companies in the past potentially said, like, yeah, we are not doing this. And then you discover after that potentially everything was tracked, everything was actually stored. So how can you build this transparency to effectively build trust with your clients? Because in theory, you should, I don't know, share the entirety of your code or give the possibility of having a full access to your architecture to really give, to really build you know, trust on your customers. And anyway, like non-technical people will really never know and never really be able to explore that internal, right? 
Well, at, at the end of the day, we all can lie, but uh, <laughs> but I mean, uh, well, we usually do what we say we do, and I mean, it can be proved if you check the cookies that are stored, you know if you have been tracked or not. So, I mean, uh, that that's the approach. I'm not sure that I that I have an answer for that. Building trust is something very diffi um, difficult, and also it depends on. On, on brands, as, as I was saying. So, but building trust is not only about taking uh, care of consumers' privacy. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a lot of things all together. So, but this is one just bit, uh, one, one bit. So then there are many things that goes, uh, as Nina was saying, with uh, how ethical your product is and, and all these things. It's a relationship. This is only an, an item. So, as I was saying, that the first thing that you can that you can do is just being clear with them, telling them, okay, uh, do you want to be uh, do you want to be personalized? Do you want to have this sophisticated experience? So that's a step because now everyone has this feeling in mind, like, well, I'm being tracked because I'm seeing these ads and, and I've been talking about this and now I'm seeing this. So being transparent, I think that that is a good starting point. Like saying to them, hey, this data that you are sharing is here and, and you are the owner of it and you can delete it. And this is not being shared with anyone. It's just for you. So I feel that that's a good first step for from brands to start doing that. But as I said, it's a, it's a, a, a lot of things, a lot of pieces in the puzzle. But it's a first step because I think that everyone now has in mind these things that I'm being tracked, I'm being personalized. So if brands start doing these kind of initiatives, it's it's a good starting point for for creating this relationship based on trust. Yes, yeah. I was saying that like context is um, very important and the contextualized search, like giving the opportunity and, and showing them what you do and how you do it and when you do it. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for the question. So we have another question. Finney has a question. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question on the events that you're tracking. Um, so you're stopping at the Air to Basket event and uh, excluding the actual purchase event. Uh, is this on purpose and what's the reasoning behind that? Well, uh, to be honest, the, uh, I'm going to be very transparent. I've only uh, used, the, I've only put in here the query, click, and unto car events because it's mainly uh, what what our customers uh, want uh, to to track. But to be honest, we have the purchase uh, event as well, uh, but uh, but it's not been uh, used a lot for from from clients so i didn't put a lot of attention but it's we, we have it out there we can enable or, or it can be enabled or, or disable but following the the same the same idea as, as the other as the other three and um, yes but well at, at the end we added it in the past because it was like well to complete like this kind of funnel but the search experience uh, goes more from the intention to the click on the product rather than what happens in the conversion funnel. So that's why we are not giving a lot of uh, importance in the presentation, but it's there. It's uh, it can be enabled by by clients. Okay, so we have um, also two questions from the online audience, and I will read them out now. The one comment says, "Great talk. Um, how can you ensure that the information?" stored by the client is not stolen by other systems? Well, that's a very good question. But I, I will be, uh, I'm product director, so I will be lying you if I answer that question, but that's a very good one. And it's a pity that it's an online one because we could be discussing <laughs> that in here later on. Okay. So, but yes, it's a... Uh, so I see, um, I, I guess, um, yeah, um, the people interested can contact you and yes, um, find please. out. Yeah. And yeah. then the, the other question um, is, um, are those front components open sourced? Yes, that's a very good one. I, I also want to say it, but well, you know, um, yes, those components are, are all open sourced and very well documented. So 
uh, as I was saying. We have the product owner of that uh, front-end component library in there. So uh, we, can, we can share, well, feel free to contact me, but in our website, in the, in the documentation, there you have link and all the documentation and everything. So you can have a look. We have more than 100 uh, components that uh, can be very uh, customized, uh, they are very customizable, and you can like put all together to build the experience that you want. But yes, those are open source. Great, so I guess the people who are interested in um, seeing those open source components can check the website and Yes, um, and check out. the documentation. I mean, there is all the information about the link and everything. Cool. Um, so any other questions in the audience, like online or Offline, <laughs> it's not the case. But I have a I have a question. So, um, in your presentation, you you showed um, you're focusing on let's say the e-commerce um, domain. Are there also other domains that you that you're working on, or that um, your product could be applied on? Well, uh, we are focused in in commerce, search and discovery. As I was saying, it's not only search, but it's also all that has to do with navigation, browsing, and, and even uh, recommendations. And uh, yeah, we do also uh, content, uh, some kind of content search for for other websites or the other customers that we have. So it's not only focused in in products. So it's goes beyond that. But. I see. Thanks a lot. Um, Thank so. You. Any other question? Last chance? Oh, there are. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> who was first? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, if if I understand correctly, you're positioning. You're a software vendor, and so you're part of a um, e-commerce website architecture. So. Uh, did you find sometimes uh, a situation when the customer installs your product, but also use tracking systems like Google Analytics or things like that? And how do you consider this? Will you educate your customer, which is uh, obviously in between you, your product, and the end user? Yeah. That's a that's very good question, and uh, yeah, we have fa faced that, of course, because we we um, we have this position in like not influencing but educating, but telling them what is your what is our vision. But at the end of the day, a brand and especially a big uh, e-commerce brand, there is a, a lot of complexity in there. So um, if they if they we always find. Uh, try to find clients that are aligned with our vision. When we have conversations with them, we realize that, well, we, we have this, this feeling in common. We can be good friends. But uh, sometimes, um, well, when you, as I was saying, when you face a big enterprise customer, I mean, you cannot change that environment. You, can, you cannot, you can influence, you can educate, you can work together. But uh, one of the, um, of the, um, and differentiators of the cap, uh, characteristic of uh, empathy platform, the product that uh, I was referring all the time, is that it's uh, extensible. So what uh, what we usually do is okay, this is uh, the product is like this, but if you have other sources, other thing, uh, something that you want to to connect with the into the relevancy, well, we give uh, for big enterprise customers. We give them the this possibility of adapting, so that's that's more or less the the okay. approach. But Thank a you. very good question. Thank you. So I also have another short question from the online audience that I would like mm -hmm. to ask before you. Um, so in your experience, which industry store the most PII during e-commerce shopping? That's for you, Nina. Which word? Sorry, can you repeat uh, that? PII. Or which? Yeah. Uh, which industries store the most PID in e-commerce shopping? That's a good question. <laughs> I would have to check that. I can't cannot answer that from the top of my head. Yeah, Not it's it's a bit risky, right? To to yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, uh, I just forward the questions. Um, I could drop yeah. some names, but yeah. yeah, it's well a lot of okay. questions. Very good. <coughs> so maybe one last um, question. 
Um, I wondered, uh, you said that when you have queries and clicks um, stored per session, how long does the session last by default? And is there an opportunity to store that to, to a profile if I want uh, to, to have that next time? The, no. the, the, you know? Yeah. The, the session ID is uh, automatically uh, generated. It's a, and it lasts like, uh, well, the standard idea of a session, online session is three minutes. So uh, that's what it, uh, what it lasts. And uh, as I was saying, once the session is finished, the ID uh, is, is, is deleted. So uh, once the consumer goes back to, the, to that website, It's another new uh, session ID is generated. And as I was saying, it's not persisted in the, in the system. It's used for uh, connecting interactions, but it's not persisted in the system. So that's, uh, that's the idea. That's okay. It. So Very then, good. thank you, um, Lara and Nina, for the great talk and for the Q&A. And I guess we can uh, conclude the talk. Um, let's thank the speakers again. Oh, thanks for thank, you. thank you. Thank you.